Hello everyone and welcome to another session of computational algebraic geometry. Today we're going to talk about solving systems of polynomials using a Grobner basis. So in the past weeks we discussed how to solve univariate polynomials and before that we talked about Grobner bases. So now we combine those two to solve higher dimensional polynomial systems. So first of all let's uh, set up some notation. So throughout I will talk about an ideal inside of a polynomial ring. So I will be an ideal inside of a polynomial ring in n variables. Uh, so for simplicity, you can take the field of coefficients to be the rational numbers or some subfield of the complex numbers. Also, uh, now the zero sets of this ideal can be arbitrarily complicated. Uh, we're interested in the cases where I defines finitely many points. So we say I is zero dimensional when the zero locus of I, here we can talk about, let's say, the algebraic closure of K and this uh, space Kn, K bar N, but maybe it's better to just think of this uh, simplified case. So we're, the zero locus of this ideal should give me finitely many points in Cn. So here, a very quick warning that it's very important that we pass to an algebraic closure or work with a field that is already algebraically closed because I can take ideals or even a single equation which has no solutions even over the base field but it will have infinitely many solutions over an algebraically closed field. And so you can take this equation x squared plus y squared plus 1 with k equals r then there are no solutions over R or Q or whatever, but there will be solutions over C. And so it's very important to pass to algebraic closures. Also, I would like to assume that I does not define fat points. So I would like all of my points to be reduced. So the ideal uh, theoretic language for this statement is to say that I is a radical ideal. And sometimes people write I equals this radical symbol i. So if you don't know what a radical means, then you don't care, uh, but this point-wise description will work. In any case, both dimension and being radical is a purely algebraic property, so it can be checked purely algebraically without computing the points. To sum up, we now have i is a radical zero-dimensional ideal. And the goal for today is to find uh, the zeros of this ideal. And there are many ways to find the zero set. Today we're going to talk about a way that uses Grobner bases to reduce it to univariate polynomials. So I should note that, of course, I, by Hilbert's basis theorem, is always generated by finitely penny polynomials, let's say f1 through fk, so that finding z of i is equivalent to finding points in c of n, let's say, tuples. So in this case where I'm thinking of Cn now. So finding the zero set of this ideal corresponds to uh, finding simultaneous zeros of these polynomials f1 through fk. And this set we assume to be finite and reduced. And I would like to describe these points in Cn. So that's why we're tr trying to solve systems of polynomials. Of course, conversely, if you give me a, a bunch of polynomials, I just consider the ideal generated by them and then I'm uh, in this setup. Well, okay, so let's talk about the idea of reducing to univariate polynomials. So let's take a simple uh, picture. So these two dimensional pictures are actually very good at capturing what's happening. So I'm drawing here uh, R2, but C2 behaves just uh, the same or uh, any other field for that matter. And let's suppose I have a bunch of points like this. So these points are the zero locus of my ideal. What I would like to do is to project to one of the coordinates. For example, I project here to the x-axis. Now, if all of my points have distinct x-coordinates, then perhaps I can solve for these x-coordinates, and then the y-coordinates will be expressible in terms of those points. So that's the uh, first idea. So how do we uh, realize this? All right, so with this assumption, if I intersect i with the polynomial ring in x, then I will find a polynomial, let's call it px, that will generate this uh, intersection ideal. 
and the zeros of px will give me the zeros of these x coordinates. So we've discussed this before in a previous lecture within the context of Hilbert's null ansatz. So in other words, if the coordinates here are a1, a2, a3, a4, so maybe this point is a1, b1, this is a2, b2, and so on, then p of x should be, if it's monic, will be the product of x minus ai's. So this is essentially just Hilbert's null ansatz, and we discussed this in, uh, before. Uh, now, assuming this uh, px is something that I can find, then I can also describe the points b1, b2, b3, b4. So I would like a polynomial in x that evaluates to bi at ai. This is done by interpolation in general. And we can write down this polynomial q of x explicitly. Okay, so qx will be a sum of something like this. So here I engineered it so that each sum end, so each term here, I can treat uh, separately. What happens is that if I evaluate this expression, so the only polynomial expression is here at the top that has x inside, these are constants. If I evaluate this x at aj for j different than i, this product vanishes, so this term vanishes, uh, which means that at, when I evaluate x at any of, well, at uh, ai, only one term in the sum end will survive. Everything else will be zero. And the term that survives will precisely be this term. When I'm having a product for over j, not equal to i. And when x equals ai, this will be a product of ai minus aj's. It will cancel this term at the bottom. I'll get one here. And therefore, I'll have bi from this term. So here, q of ai will indeed be bi. Now, i should be the ideal generated by first px, or, or maybe I write y minus qx first, and then px. This is also Hilbert's nurstel ansatz, together with the fact that i was a radical ideal. In any case, it's clear that uh, by design that the zero set of this ideal agrees with the zero set of my ideal, which consists of ai's and bi's, this ai bi pairs rather. So the first polynomial px ensures that x must be one of these values, and the second term here ensures that y must have the value bi for x equal ai. Now, if, if uh, I can find px and qx, then of course uh, I just need to solve for px using one of the techniques we learned in the past weeks. So this is a univariate polynomial. I solve for px and then I plug in my solutions to qx to find y. And therefore I can solve for each of the ai's bi's. But I, would, I need a method to find qx and px. Here's how you can solve for this px and qx. You just observe the following, that this construction gives me reduced Grubner basis for i. And we talked about uh, how to compute a Grubner basis of an ideal. So uh, what I need to do is first find the reduced Grubner basis of i. Uh, so we talked about having an order on a reduced Grubner basis. Well, well, we can just order the polynomials according to their leading terms. So here, this is the reduced Grubner basis with respect to the Lex ordering that makes y greater than x. Here, the multi-degree of g1 is 0, 1, and that's greater than the multi-degree of g2, which will be d0, where d is the degree of p. Okay, so here, uh, I assumed y greater than x, so 0, 1 is greater than anything comma 0. Okay, so now to extract the key point here, let's talk about what would happen if I was thinking in uh, n dimensions instead of two dimensions. So one of the ingredients was this projection. So let's talk about uh, the following case. So I take an ideal defining a zero dimensional scheme and uh, I take the Lex ordering. So it doesn't matter what I take. Let's take this x1 through xn. And let's say I have a reduced Grobner basis g1 through gk. Okay, then gk is a univariate polynomial in xn. And the zero set of gk is just a projection of the zero set of i. 
Now let's state the main result that helps in reducing polynomial systems to a univariate polynomial. This main result is called the shape lemma. It says that, so given a zero dimensional radical ideal, if we have the following uh, statement about projections, so if all complex solutions of I have dis distinct nth coordinate, so here you can replace complex with k bar, if k is a different field. So if I take such an ideal, then the lexicographic Grubner basis of I has a very simple form. So the reduced lexicographic Grubner basis with the right uh, ordering is of the form x1 is p1 minus xn, x2 is p2 minus xn, etc. And here I have xn minus 1, and finally I have pn xn. So moreover, here the degree, degree of pi will be strictly less than the degree of pn for n less than i less than n. So first of all, what this say, is saying is that if I compute the reduced Grubner basis, then I solve for my polynomial system, meaning that I solve for the zero set of the ideal, because I just uh, solve for the univariate polynomial pn using one of many techniques. And then I just plug in the solutions to these other polynomials to find the other coordinates x1 through xn minus 1. This also gives you an idea why a lexicographic Grubner basis is actually uh, hard to compute because it contains so much information. So I've essentially given you the proof when n equals 2, when I have only two variables, uh, it can get a little bit more complicated in general, but I would like to give you the sketch of the proof. Okay, so we already have an exercise of, uh, before this lemma that says that there exists a univariate polynomial Pn generating i intersected with the polynomial x ring generated by xn. And it's clear that the reduced Grubner basis will have as the last element such a uh, polynomial. Now you could try to argue uh, in trying to find x1 through xn minus 1 using a geometric technique as we did, but it's actually cleaner to understand what it means for all complex solutions to have distinct nth coordinates in a language that is maybe more appropriate to this setting. And the setting is the following. We have a projection map from, let's say, for simplicity, let's just work with Cn to C that projects a point to its nth coordinate. And dually, I have an an injection of rings, so this was surjection, uh, conversely I have this injection, into the polynomial ring with n variables. So here k should be c. What I can do now to incorporate the ideal is to consider the quotient rings. I say, that in fact, the zero scheme of i goes to the zero scheme of pn. This is always true, but my hypothesis is that every point was uh, uniquely determined by its nth coordinate means that this projection map restricted to the zero set becomes an isomorphism. And dually, so these are different pi's in the sense that I've restricted this pi to my zero set, but I'll use the same letter. So dually, here I have the polynomial xn modulo pn, and this goes to, to the polynomial ring modulo the ideal. So the spectrum of this ring is the zero scheme, and the polynomial functions on my zero scheme is this ring. So this is the dual construction, and as this is a duality, it actually preserves isomorphisms, meaning that my ring is isomorphic to this univariate ring, but that means for each xi here, this xi must be in the image of this quotient here, but this quotient is generated by just powers of xn. So this is a vector space generated by finitely many powers of xn. So d here is the degree of pn, so I just need to take these powers. In other words, there exists a polynomial in xn, so pi of xn, such that xi is equivalent to something coming from the right-hand side, so xi is in here, I take something from the right-hand side, that will be a polynomial in this polynomial pi xn modulo the ideal i. So that's, that's what this means. So the, the surjectivity of this, I would have meant already, uh, the statement, in other words, xi minus pi of xn is inside the ideal. So if they are equivalent, then the difference is inside the ideal.
So this replaces the geometric idea in and our interpolation argument, that kind of thing. But uh, the rest is easy now. Once you find these polynomials that I just cooked up downstairs, now you have to show that they generate the ideal i. This is Hibbert's Nullstell ansatz, and then show that these have to be a reduced Grubner basis with respect to this lexicographic ordering. But these are all trivial. So I give the remainder of the proof as exercise. So I must issue a warning here. If you violate the hypothesis of the shape lemma, which was uh, that the nth coordinate determines uh, points on your zero scheme, then uh, the shape lemma will not hold. And it's a good exercise to find some examples where the reduced Grubner basis with respect to an appropriate lexicographic ordering does not have the desired form. Of course, make it interesting for yourself, so find interesting i. Now, if we said if we relax the conditions of the shape lemma, then we fail. Uh, but we can change also the statement a little bit and uh, get a clear result. So the first I need a lemma that I'll prove later on. So let's call this the form lemma. I mean, this is a name that I just made up. Suppose we are given a zero-dimensional radical ideal in a polynomial ring, as usual. Then the general linear form satisfies the following. If I take two distinct points in the zero set of i, then u of a will be distinct from u of b. In other words, here uh, this is a bunch. This defines a bunch of points, and I just want to find a linear form that evaluates to a different value in each of these finitely many points. Here, I need to assume k is infinite. So, of course, if k is finite, you can pass to its algebraic closure. Uh, any algebraically closed field is infinite. So, this is not a huge restriction in principle. So, before I uh, prove this form lemma. Let's uh, look at how we can use it in practice to modify the shape lemma. So once again, I take a zero-dimensional radical ideal and then polynomial ring and n variables, and I take u as above. But I will assume that the a n here is non-zero. Of course, this is not really an assumption. I can just permute my variables until the last variable has non-zero coefficient here. So that's without loss of generality. So then I'm saying that there exists a basis for i, which has the following form. So I will have x1 equals, or rather, x1 minus p1 u. So p1 is a univariate polynomial, and I plug in the form u, x2 minus p2 u, etc. So this is just the shape lemma when u equals xn. And of course, the additional conditions also hold so with degree of pi strictly less than the degree of pn with when i is less than n. So any of these have degree less than pn. And the proof is very simple. We just have to make sure uh, we get the conditions satisfied in the shape lemma. And we do this by a change of variables. The proof is uh, very simple. The first thing you need to do is to change coordinates. So maybe I create new coordinates, y1 through yn. So y1 goes to x1, up to yn minus 1 goes to xn minus 1. But then I would like the nth coordinate to go to u. So this is by design. So here that's why I assumed an is non-zero. Uh, this will be an isomorphism of the polynomial rings between the polynomial ring generated by yi's and the polynomial ring generated by x1s. Here, you can just pull back the ideal here into this ring and then apply shape lemma. OK, so I have i here. I wrote i prime for the image here. By the way, the, you can also write down the inverse by just inverting this linear map. So it will be easy to describe i prime. Just apply the inverse map here to the generators of i to get i prime. So this, uh, this means we can actually apply shape lemma that is, we compute a reduced Grubner basis here, according to some lexicographic ordering. And that gives me generators that look like this after I apply my transformation again. So I'm actually not just saying that I have such a basis, but in fact, I gave you a recipe for computing this basis. 
So this uh, modified shape lemma is especially important uh, theoretically. So it's important practically because it tells me how to solve the polynomial system. But also theoretically, it's very nice uh, because it gives me a complete description of this quotient ideal. So I, I have this x1 through xn. I quotient out by the ideal given to me. And then I observe that this must be isomorphic to what I can write as ku divided by this pn of u. So here I can treat u as an abstract variable, so yn, and pn is this pn here. So this is a univariate polynomial ring. Uh, this I've just identified the variable here with the linear form over here. So the, this statement is just a direct consequence of the proof of the shape lemma, not this one, the one before. So there I use a similar argument, so this is immediate. And this just allows me to treat this quotient as a quotient of a very simple polynomial ring. In particular, uh, you see the number of solutions over here must equal to the degree of Pn. So the number of solutions in, let's say, the algebraic closure has to equal the degree of Pn. So the reason is we've made a change of coordinates so that every solution here is completely determined by its u value. And then what matters is how many u values there are. And that's exactly the number of roots of Pn. Okay, so an important part of this modified shape lemma was the form lemma and the existence of such u. Moreover, uh, the fact that the general linear form will satisfy the desired condition. So if I choose AIs randomly, let's say over the rationals, then I would like to believe that the, with probability one, I'm going to hit u satisfying this condition. So if I don't want to first solve for this ideal, but I would like to use u to solve the system, then uh, this random construction uh, would be very useful. So let's talk about how I can prove the form lemma. Okay, so let's assume that my zero set looks like this. Maybe it's uh, at the vertices of a rectangle so that neither of the projections can distinguish the points. So what I would like to find is a linear form that is able to distinguish between the, these points. What does it mean? So that if I consider the level sets of u, so that u equals some value lambda, maybe I call lambda 1. So this is a level set. So the u is a linear form in x and y. So this or maybe my variables a1, x1 plus a2, x2. So this uh, linear expression equal to a constant lambda 1 gives me a line. And another level set looks like this. So here is a level set that contains one of my points, and so on. Another level set. So what I want is that any of these level sh sets should contain at most one point. So at most one point from zi. But if that's my goal, then I can already rule out the bad lines. So this, there is this offending line here. There is an offending line here. This one, this one, this one, and that one. So for every pair of points, I can draw a line. And now any of the parallel translates of these lines would be bad. So I don't want u to have slope equal to any of these six lines. So what I've done now is I've passed from considering the level sets to considering the slope of the level set that's determined by the pair a1 and a2. And I've found all the offending slopes. So for each pair of points, I get an offending slope. And now it's clear, of course, uh, here I, I get finitely many offending slopes. I have infinitely many slopes that are available to me if k is infinite. So I just take one of the available slopes to me, one of infinitely many available slopes to me, and that u will work. So let's streamline this argument a little bit and work with arbitrary number of variables. What I want to do is not to just uh, replicate this argument in higher dimensions, because of course I can, and this might be a good exercise. So you might uh, stop the video right now and try to think about what would happen in three dimensions. I mean, again, you have finitely many slopes for each pair of points. You get a line, you define something like a slope, but now u defines a plane. So you have to say that these lines should not be parallel to your planes. Again, so this argument can be generalized. It's a good exercise to do so. But what I want to do is clean up the argument a little bit. It is still too messy. And I would like to express it in terms of objects that are familiar to us. So first of all, here's what I'm doing. So I take for every A and B in my solution set, so which I view in maybe Cn or 
k n bar. I consider this a minus b, or rather the line spanned by it. And if a and b are distinct, and that's what I want, I'm not going to land in zero. And since I'm interested in the line here, maybe I should consider the projectivization here. So I was considering the line generated by I, a minus b. So I might as well consider a minus b inside of p and minus one. Okay, so for pairs of points in the zero set of the ideal over an algebraically closed field, I consider the set of differences considered as points in p n minus one. So this is a finite set of points. Finite set of points in the projective space or finite set of lines in c n. So we can also notice that the linear forms are parametrized by the dual projective space. So I put a hat here to denote that this is the pro dual projective space. It's isomorphic to the uh, original projective space, especially if you have coordinates, then this isomorphism looks canonical, but they do different things. So remember if, since this Pn is the projectivization of Cn, this is the projectivization of the dual Cn. In particular, this is the projectivization of the vector space of linear forms. So that's why given any u, this gives me a point here. And now it's actually very simple. We've discussed the duality between the projective space and its dual. Um, and well, if you think about this, each point in the projective space defines what's called a dual hyperplane that parametrizes all linear forms that annihilate P, so that evaluate to zero at P. So maybe if you want to be really pedantic, let's put brackets around here. So P is a point in Cn, then I can define this evaluation. And then you just observe that the kind of u we want lies in, in the complement of a finite many hyperplanes. So remember S was the set of points defined by the translation of my points, pairwise translations. So any u inside of a hyperplane takes the same value in A and B and conversely. So the kind of good u that we want lies in the complements of finitely many hyperplanes. Since k is infinite, this is not empty. In fact, this is very far from being empty. And this also gives meaning to the fact that we could have taken u to be general. So there's a natural uh, variety that parameterizes all possible u, all possible linear forms, and there exists a Zariski closed set in the complement of the Zariski closed set, any u does the, has the property that we want. All right, that concludes the proof of the form lemma. And from this, we have the modified shape lemma and that allows us to solve any system of polynomial equation. I have not told you how to find u in practice, but this uh, you can sort of cook up uh, homemade methods. And basically this argument says that if you randomly generate a linear form u, then it will satisfy the desired hypothesis sort of quote unquote with probability one. Okay, that's it for today. See you in the next lecture.